everybody and uh, welcome uh, once again to space sync series of talks today we're talking about journeys into space and we've got richard taylor still with us today and it's their science week this week so it's a really good week for us to discuss journeys into space hello everybody how are you doing say hello, hello. Um, so if you bear with me i'm just going to share my screen for you and then we'll make sure that you can see my slides so here we go and i'm gonna start the slide <laughs> now can you see my slides yeah okay, fantastic so we're going to be talking about journeys into space today. So I thought we'd start not just with flying into space with spaceships and stuff, but going back to some of the early um, things that people were doing to just look at from Earth. And humans have been looking at space since the beginning of humanity, probably since before we were able to write anything down. Um, but we know that people were observing the stars, people were painting things on walls, looking at them, things that they could see in the heavens. And there was lots of stories and mythology that grew up around what people could see in space. And that lots of things like the planets are named after um, Greek and Roman gods. And that every culture, as far as we know, has looked to the heavens and tried to work out what was going on, what was up there. Um, but coming on to sort of more modern ideas of exploring space, and there are some important principles that we're just going to touch on briefly. So celestial and orbital mechanics. So this is basically about how things move in space, whether they're natural objects like planets and stars and comets or mechanics um, for orbital stuff. We're more talking about the way rocket ships and satellites move. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about gravity, which is obviously very important for people to understand if we're trying to um, escape our planet's gravity and go and use the gravity of other planets to go around them. And then rocket science or engineering, um, aerospace engineering. So we'll talk a little bit about that before we move on to how far we've come. So we'll start with um, Johannes Kepler, who was a really interesting scientist who lived a very long time ago. This was um, uh, He was born in 1571 and died in 1630. And he's a very interesting man because um, he was doing a lot of looking at the stars. He did a lot of development of uh, lenses and telescopes, working out how to use the optics. And he did a lot of tracking of the um, movement of the planets. And he wanted to understand how the planets moved around. Um, early in human history, a lot of people thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe and that everything was moving around us, which makes sense from where we're looking at. But as time went on, people like Copernicus thought that, no, the sun is at the center of the solar system and we're the ones who are moving around the sun. And the more we know, the more that see that, that that appears to be the case, that we are orbiting around the sun and then the sun is a part of our galaxy that's orbiting around something in the center of our galaxy and our galaxy is moving. And so everything's moving relative to each other. Um, and so he came up with some quite interesting um, uh, laws and rules but it was quite difficult for him because he was a very religious man and he he really believed that there was order and um, some sort of way that the universe worked that was very regular and fitted into this perfect geometry and he had all these ideas about the way the heavens moved that fit, fit these perfect shapes and perfect squares perfect circles very interested in geometry but his observations told him that that might not be correct so Kepler Although he was quite a tragic figure and had a lot of sadness in his life, it, it's, uh, it's very commendable that he was able to look past what he wanted to be true to see what his observation told him to be true. And that's very important in science to try and look past what you'd like to be the case and accept what you think is the case based on the evidence. And so he was observing Mars and he saw that sometimes Mars seemed to look like it was moving backwards in the sky and people couldn't really work this out. So he had with these maps of like this retrograde motion that Mars might be going back on itself. And it turned out, in fact, that Mars looked like it was going back on itself because the sun was kind of overtaking it because it was orbiting the sun faster uh, than Mars was orbiting the sun. And through a series of many years of work and all of his observations and calculations, he came up with Kepler's laws, which built on Copernicus's rules about um, the way planets moved. Um, so a sort of simplified version of his laws here is that planets orbit not in circles, but in ellipses, so sort of squashed circles. And this makes a big difference because it changes the way the planets move. Um, and he found that when planets are moving closer to the star they're orbiting, in our case, the sun, they move faster and as they get further away, they move slower. Um, so um, the way he looked at it is that 
um, orbiting planets sweep out equal areas of their ellipse over equal time. And it's quite tricky to get your head around, but I've got a little animation here that kind of shows you what I mean. So you can see, and this is kind of an exaggerated um, uh, movement here, but you can see that as this little planet is going around the center, it gets faster as it gets closer and then slower as it gets further away. And you can see that that little sort of purpley blue wedge it's sweeping out gets longer and thinner and then shorter and fatter. But if you were to take the area of that wedge, it would always be the same area. So this is a very strict rule that the way planets move around. And it means that there's a predictable relationship coming to his third law between the distance of a planet from its sun and how long its year is, how long it takes to do its orbital path. And so this means that when we look at our planets, the closer they are to the sun, the shorter their year is, the quicker it is for them to go around. And the further you get out, the longer it takes. So starting all the way in at Mercury, it's only got 88 day year, then 225 days for Venus. Of course, Earth has 365, although it's just slightly over that. So we stick in a leap year um, every four years um, to try and even that out a little bit. Then Mars is just about two years. And then we've got that big jump as we talked about the scale of the solar system last a uh, couple of weeks ago. And so there's a big jump in distance when you get out to the outer planets. And so it's 11.9 years for Jupiter and then nearly 30 years for Saturn, 84 years for Uranus and 165 years for Neptune, which is what made it quite difficult to know that Neptune was a planet and not just a point of light that could have been a star or something because it's moving so slowly to our eyes um, that it was difficult to track its movement because it takes... Uh, 100, 165 years to go around, so you wouldn't be able to observe a complete orbit in a human lifetime. Um, so then we we'll move on a little bit to gravity. I wanted to ask you, does anybody know who this is a picture of? Yes. Who do you think, Ben? Isaac Newton. You saying Isaac Newton, maybe? Yeah, so very well done. So that is Isaac Newton. So obviously this is a painting because he was alive long before there were um, photographs available. So he died in 1726. And so he was instrumental in understanding um, theories of gravity and coming up with the kind of maths needed to understand a lot of the sort of classical mechanics um, that people use then. And yeah, really interesting stuff. Very clever man, but uh, by all accounts, not very nice man. There are lots of stories about the people that worked for him in his later career, um, working, making coinage. He used to run the mint that makes the money. Um, and he apparently was a, a very brutal person to work for very strange and difficult to get on with. He did all sorts of weird and wonderful things trying to understand light and did bizarre things to try and understand light, like stick needles in his own eyes and stuff. Very, very strange man, but undoubtedly very important in understanding gravity. Um, and his classical mechanics that he worked out the formula for really lasted for hundreds of years. And to this day, we still can use it to understand the movement of the planets. But when people started to look at um, some different phenomena that were further away in the universe or in, involve massive, big masses like black holes and the way light and time moves, we needed somebody else to come up with a with a, a new framework for how gravity works. So does anybody know who this is? Any ideas? Sunny? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Excellent. Very good. That is Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein, him, he was alive up until fairly recently. So although he was born way back in uh, 1879, he lived until 1955. Um, he is a very interesting man, uh, persecuted because of his religion, because he was uh, Jewish. So uh, obviously during World War II and the rise of uh, the Nazi regime, uh, lots of Jewish scientists were displaced from where they lived in Europe and had to move. A lot of people moved to America. And we'll talk a little bit more about other people that moved to America a little bit later related to the Nazi regime. Um, and Albert Einstein, he came up with um, a different type of way of understanding gravity called general relativity. So um, this is all really complex stuff that um, takes a long time for people to learn. But ultimately, classical mechanics on the left that Newton came up with understood gravity by looking at the mass of objects and their distance from each other. And you can work out by um, doing this calculation at the bottom here of the mass of um, your um, first object and your second object over the distance of um, square of their distance from each other and using these little uh, mathematical tricks called constants where you can put a number in. You can work out exactly how much each object is attracted to each other by gravity and then therefore how it will move. And that works very well for most sort of real world cases for us to understand. But um, Einstein came up with his general relativity, which uses a more geometric way of understanding it. And he um, 
came up with the concept of space time and understanding um, massive objects is almost making dents and bulges in space time. And here you can see an example of a planet sitting on the fabric of space time and making a dip in it. And so this is the way he visualized um, uh, planets moving around each other. It's all really funky stuff. And then he did a lot of stuff about the way time and light moves. And it's all very interesting. And we can do another talk about that if you like, because time actually travels uh, moves differently depending how fast you're going, and that's all down to Einstein and his theory of the 20th century. And they work very, 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 very well. Um, but like I say, um, classical mechanics also did a fantastic job and is still um, perfectly <coughs> adequate for understanding a lot of the way that gravity works. So once we understand these kind of concepts about gravity and um, the way things move around each other, you can have a whole field of science called orbital mechanics. Um, and this is about um, working out how rocket ships and satellites and stuff will move when they go through the solar system. And um, I wonder, does anybody know who this woman is here? We'd like to have a guess at that one. We've got blank faces, I'm afraid. No, I think you might, and it's a real shame. Um, this is Catherine Johnson, and she was born in 1918, and she is still with us. She's 100 years old. Uh, she's a mathematician. She's very instrumental in understanding orbital mechanics and did a lot of work for NASA calculating all by hand all of their um, mathematics needed to launch things and also was instrumental in developing the computers um, and implementing the computer processing systems that would go forward in the future to to um, to describe the way these rockets move. And Katherine Johnson is African-American and up until um, the uh, sort of middle part of the 20th century and still ongoing today, there's been a lot of, um, of oppression of black people in America. And so Katherine Johnson wasn't allowed to attend school after eighth grade in her local county. So she had to travel with her family a quite a fair distance to be able to even get to go to school. She was always very gifted at maths and she's a fantastic and very interesting woman. And as you say, people often know who Newton and Einstein and a lot of these other scientists are, but um, often um, women and particularly women of color get overlooked in the history book. So I do urge you to go and read about Katherine Johnson, and we'll talk a little bit more about her later. She's a fantastic woman. Um, so on to aerospace engineering. Um, there's lots of different factors you have to look at when you're designing things. You have to think about aerodynamics, the way that um, uh, air will move over, the atmosphere will move over your, your um, spaceship. Propulsion, how are you going to get it to move when it's in space, when it launches. You need to know how much um, it weighs and how much fuel it will need to break those effects of gravity and reach what they call escape velocity, which is the speed you need to be going to um, remove yourself from the effects of gravity of the planet you're trying to leave and get away. Um, avionics is all about the electronic engineering that goes into these um, machines. Material science, you need to understand how are these things going to perform under pressures and temperatures and vibrations that are um, going on in space. And that also goes on to structural analysis where they do lots of this testing. Um, here on the right, we've got a picture of Werner von Braun, who was actually a member of the Nazi party and the SS in World War II. And he was a rocket engineer. And along with um, 1,600 other German scientists, he was allowed to come to the United States and continue his work and is without doubt uh, been a huge influence and done a lot for um, rocket science. But, you know, um, the ethical argument of, is it okay to allow people to continue their work that they're doing when, if they weren't who they were and didn't have the skills they had, would they have been prosecuted for war crimes? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of history to this um, related to World War II and the German scientists. And at the same time, you had Jewish scientists like, uh, Albert Einstein, who had to come to America because of people like Werner von Braun. So there's a lot of history wrapped up in, in this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the history um, and going forward after World War II and the effect that had on, the, on um, humans going to space. So just here's a little picture of a, an aeroplane model in a wind tunnel. So these are some of the things they do to test the aerodynamics and they will um, put smoke in there to like watch it flow and they use a lot of computer modeling in this day and age to see how things move across it and you see this not just in the space industry but obviously in things like uh, airplane and car development and uh, formula one um, cars go through a lot of these kind of things as well to see how their aerodynamics work uh, because any of these things that are moving really fast have to make sure that they're not going to get too much friction from the atmosphere passing over them and breaking off or heating up parts of their um, machinery 
here we have my colleague, this is Theo, he works at my laboratory, and here he is in the rooms, and here in his hand, you can, if you can see that little wheel with all the colours on it, this is the filter wheel that is going up to Mars on the ExoMars rover inside a camera called PanCam. So that's going to Mars, and um, Theo is testing it here, putting it into some thermal cycling chambers to expose it to a range of temperatures from uh, 50 degrees all the way down to minus 150 degrees Celsius to see how it performs in Mars temperatures before it gets sent off to space. So these are the kind of things you have to do if you want to journey to space and test all your materials. And obviously this is important for all um, instruments, but it's especially important if you've got humans on board because you're not just going to lose your instrument, you're going to lose human lives. And sadly we have had instances where um, astronauts have died. Um, there's been a couple of space shuttle disasters and in the Soviet Union we've also had uh, people died during testing stages and same for NASA in America. So these things are really important to get right. Uh, so question for you. Uh, does anyone know what was the first mission to orbit the Earth? Oh, first mission to orbit the Earth. What do you think? Emma? Was it with a dog? Emma would like to oh, know. Okay. Not quite the first one, but we'll come to that. That's a very oh, good um, answer. Okay. Freddie, what do you think? Was it the V2? Was it the V2, Freddie's asking? Okay, very, again, very good knowledge. V2 was the rocket system um, a lot of uh, the spacecraft were based off of, again, that came from the World War II um, German scientist period. But no, that's not the first one. Any more guesses? Oh, let's see. Shall we have Lola? Uh, was it the Eagle? Was it the Eagle? Ah, so I see where you come from there. Eagle is the name of the landing module for um, uh, the Apollo 11 mission that landed on the surface. So that was the first thing to land on the moon, but not the first mission to orbit the Earth. Okay, we'll have one more try, shall we? Uh, George? Is it um, a Gemini? Was it a Gemini? Ah, again, this is another NASA, um, NASA mission thing that went around. So Gemini was one of the first ones to go around the Earth, the Americans, but... It was the Soviet Union, the Russians were the first to do it. So Sputnik is the name of the first part of Mars. Um, launched yeah. back in 1957, and it was just a little ball with um, with some electronics on it that just went up and all around the air. And so there was a lot of rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union at this time. This all followed on from the politics of World War II, and you had these two superpowers who were very into of coming the strongest superpower, a lot of money invested into military and a lot of money um, invested into space because this period was what they call the Cold War. Because after 1945, um, at the end of World War II, um, we, the Allies had developed the nuclear bomb and obviously um, dropped two bombs on Japan, causing huge devastation, mass loss of life, awful radioactive fallout afterwards, and people saw the, the horror of nuclear bombs and they are so destructive that if you were to have a nuclear war it would just be the end of everybody because if two countries started firing them at each other it's not sustainable it just means pretty much certain death for or probably everyone on the planet oh i'm sorry i think my um my screen's gonna be funny bear with me a second there we go sorry about that so uh yeah um, so the Cold War, what they decided to do instead was basically have this kind of what they call maybe like a proxy war where you have something else that you fight over so that you don't have to actually fight each other because it's too destructive. Um, and so they decided to go for the space race, see who could get into space first, who could go to the moon first, and the Soviets were successful in getting the first um, mission to orbit Earth. Since that things have got a little bit more collaborative with space exploration, and we'll come to that in a moment. So, um, does anyone know who was the first human um, in space, and whether that was a Soviet? Um, first human in space, like Amelia. Was it, um, was it the Soviet Union? Oh, yes, we have talked about it. The name's escaped. Let's see if anybody else can remember Sonny. I don't know his last name, but his name is Yuri. Yuri, someone who can help with the surname, Emma. Yuri and Gagarin. Gagarin, is it? <laughs> yeah, very well done. So this um, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, 12th of April 1961, was the first human in space. So the 
the United States at the time was pretty devastated over this. Not only had they lost the race to get the first uh, orbiter up there, but they just lost the chance to get in the record books with them, the first human in space. And um, so they were absolutely intent on getting to the moon first. They wanted to do whatever it took to, to not let the Soviets beat them again. Um, with this. So as I say, this was all at a time, people were very worried at the time that there would be nuclear war. So it was a very tense time in, in, in global politics um, and very interesting to read about. Um, so this is the spacecraft that Yuri Gagarin was in, Vostok 1. And uh, it's pretty tiny. He would just sit in that little ball at the end. Um, scary stuff as well. You know, we're talking some of the processing power, computing power that they had back then um, was not much different than you'd, you'd get in like a digital watch and certainly much less than probably your phone that you've got today. So it was really quite incredible that they were able to do these things with so little um, technology um, compared to the really a time for innovation. So um, who was the first person to walk on the moon? Anybody know the answer to this? Jack. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Oh, got it in one, fantastic. Yes, yeah, so finally the United States got what they wanted. They got the first human on the moon. So Neil Armstrong, Set foot on the moon, 21st of July, 1959. And um, pretty much everybody knows this, but I'm wondering, do, does anybody know the name of the rest of his team? There were two other people with him that um, went to the moon, okay. and two the moon, and one set up in the craft. What are their names? Yeah, lots of hands have gone up. Right, Jesse. Buzz Aldrin. And who can remember the third person who didn't actually land on the moon? Uh, Lola. Um, I, I know first. Talk to James. Can James help you? Mike Collins. Oh, I'm so happy. I am so happy because everybody forgets poor Michael Collins. Um, so Neil Armstrong, of course, everybody knows. Buzz Aldrin was the second person on the moon. Most people know his name too. But everybody forgets poor Michael Collins, who didn't get to land on the moon and had to stay up in the orbiting aircraft. Um, and, uh, yeah, obviously that's an incredibly important job. And also, if something had gone wrong and um, Neil and Buzz uh, had um, come a cropper on the surface of the moon, it would have been Michael Collins that would have had to come back alone. So it was an incredibly important job. Um, and I'm so pleased to, to know that you know his name because he's a very nice to see him get some recognition. And so this is all part of the Apollo program, um, which wanted to go to the moon. And someone mentioned the V2 rockets earlier. I think these are very closely related, the Saturn V rocket that we saw, saw Werner von Braun with later were very closely related to these V2 rockets. And yeah, this was, like I say, all part of the USA and Soviet Union Cold War and space race. And it dominated space exploration through the late 20th century. And we haven't seen really such a push for a particular human space flight since that era. And um, I think it's probably because there isn't the political will behind it that you had then. There's no reason why we can't do it now. Um, economically and in terms of technology it's possible but there's just not the um, political will at the moment to invest in this so not that I would argue for another Cold War but that's certainly what pushed um, this innovation at that time. So a lot of people know about NASA missions but there's also a lot of Soviet missions and somebody mentioned the dog that went to space so that was in Sputnik 2, Like the dog um, went up and unfortunately never returned. Uh, the mission was designed that um, she would die up there. And so there's a, a discussion to be had about the ethics of um, testing with animals in space. And obviously we still test for lots of things on Earth with um, with animals. But these days it's not really um, something that happens that you send um, things like dogs and chimps into space. Then you had Luna 2 in 1958 from the Soviets that went to the moon. And one of the most interesting missions, I think, uh, Venera 7, um, from the 1970s, um, which went to Venus. And I, I urge you to read about this mission because it's an incredible piece of engineering. Venus is a very hostile environment with a really toxic, thick, high pressure atmosphere, incredibly hot. And they designed a spacecraft that could land on the surface and survive there to send back data. Um, so uh, do read about the Venera missions, they're really good. And NASA missions people tend to be a little bit more familiar with in the UK. Um, because of our relationship with America and the TV and stuff. And uh, they also sent animals to space. This is Ham, who went in 1961. But Ham did come back safely and um, lived his life in a, out in a, in a zoo. So he, he came back in one piece. Um, then the Mariner program from 1962 to 73 was instrumental in doing flybys of Mars and um, getting us data from that. And then John Glenn here uh, was the first American to orbit the Earth. Um, and Alan Shepard was the first 
American in base, didn't quite make it before Yuri Gagarin. But going back to Catherine Johnson that we spoke about, who did all the calculations, um, when John Glenn was going to do his, his and they were using the computer that um, had been developed to look at the um, math mathematics to see if it was all okay. And John Glenn refused to fly without Catherine Johnson checking those and making sure they were right. She was incredibly important um, to all of this work. So do, do look up about Catherine Johnson and read about her. And then this is Helen Sharman. Um, a lot of people um, don't know who Helen Sharman is. Um, and we often talk about the first as British astronaut in space um, being Tim Peake, but actually it was Helen Sharman all the way back in 1991. So she's another interesting one to go and have a look at her life. Very interesting woman. And she's actually the patron of Spacelink, which is our um, uh, charity that's bringing these talks to you today. So she's fantastic. So yeah, the NASA missions um, for the Apollo program, uh, they had um, a whole bunch of them. Apollo 13 was the one that didn't quite make it um, to land on the moon and just had to go around and come back again. Uh, there's a really good film called Apollo 13 about this. If you ever get a chance to watch it, you should. And then the last one to land on the moon um, was Apollo 17 in the early 1970s. And we haven't sent people back to the moon yet. Um, the Russians have some missions that collected samples that came back. Uh, Chinese and Indian um, space agencies are sending stuff to the moon at the moment. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping that we will send people back to the moon at some point because no one's been there for a long time. Um, then you have the space shuttle program. So the space shuttle program is really interesting because it meant that these um, shuttles were reusable, whereas all the other classic rockets sort of like broke up into pieces and uh, jettisoned all their bits off either back onto Earth or just left them in space or they'd burn up in the atmosphere. Um, the space shuttle was reusable, so it would get launched on a big rocket because it needed all that fuel to um, have the escape velocity that we spoke about earlier to leave the planet. But when it landed, the astronauts coming back in like a little capsule that they had to come down with parachutes, it just landed like a plane. And a space shuttle program it closed down a few years ago, but it's a really fantastic program. Um, but unfortunately, it was also the one that um, led to loss of human life for uh, American astronauts and astronauts from other countries as well who were on board. Um, so this is um, a bit of a sad one. There were two um, that, uh, that had incidents, one on takeoff, one on re-entry. Um, so uh, the Columbia disaster um, is one to read about. Um, so there's a, a lot of history behind the um, space shuttle program and they did some really interesting stuff. They put the Hubble telescope stuff up there, fixed the Hubble telescope, many visits to the International Space Station. and. Coming to that, um, after the Cold War period, we had a much better international collaboration with the Mir Space Station um, and the International Space Station, uniting many countries, um, astronauts from different areas, engineers, technicians, all coming together um, to work uh, across borders to carry on space travel. And so you're seeing that a bit more now. Um, the pan instrument I talked about earlier that has um, European Space Agency and Roscosmos from Russian um, instruments on it and so now it is a little better but I'd like to see obviously in the future more collaboration because <laughs> that rivalry of the Cold War might have spurred the, the money and political will to do it it's actually the collaboration of scientists that gets us the most um, progress so hopefully it's more of that in future so on to Voyager 1 and 2 so these ones are very interesting um, launched in 1977, and this is coming back to what we learned about in the beginning with Kepler's laws of planetary motion and the orbital mechanics um, that were done by people like Katherine Johnson um, and gravity that was worked out by Newton and Einstein. Voyager mission took advantage of the alignment of the outer planets to do this tour of all of the planets at the outer edge of the solar system. And Voyager 1 became the first ever human-made object to enter interstellar space and leave our solar system. So, I mean, it, that's how long it took it, from 1977 to 2012, to get to the edge of the solar system, which gives you some idea of how big our solar system is. And, and uh, Voyager 2 still remains the only um, probe that's visited uh, Uranus and Neptune because of their really long orbital periods or years. Um, we have to wait for them to get back into line, otherwise they're on the opposite side of the solar system and we can't fly past all of the planets at once. But at this point, um, when they launched this, um, we were very lucky that all of these outer planets were kind of in a line and it managed to, um, this mission managed to visit them all and get us some nice photographs. And it, it took advantage of the gravity assist 
principle um, in order to get up the speed um, to get fast enough to get where it's going and head it out of the solar system um, rocket fuel is just not good enough you just burn through it too quickly so it used what they call gravity assist or slingshotting to um, go past planets and instead of stopping and slowing down and orbiting them it would come past them and pick up a bit of speed from from their gravity of that planet and then ping off into the distance and so um orbital mechanics and kepler's laws and newton's mechanics and einstein's um, general uh, relativity and orbital mechanics people like Catherine johnson all became incredibly important um so cassini cassini is an interesting one um launched in 1997 um, it did a lot of nice stuff with saturn um, does anybody know, um, Cassini had a little probe, does anybody know anything about Cassini's probe, like what its name is or where it landed? Anybody got any ideas? No, I'm afraid we don't. <laughs> oh, I'm glad, I'm glad I get to see, normally you guys know more than me. Um, so Cassini, Cassini um, is, uh, Huygens is like the dual mission and it's named after two scientists who were um, very interested in Saturn and its moons. And Cassini saw some really interesting stuff, like it saw um, that there were these kind of like hexagon shaped patterns in the clouds in the North Pole of, of Saturn because the outer gas giants don't have a solid surface, they have cloudy atmosphere instead of a surface. And we didn't know until Cassini went about these weird patterns that you were getting there. Um, and it took some beautiful pictures where you can really see the details of the rings. Um, and also aside from that, it wanted to look at all these moons. But it took all these pictures, so that's fantastic. We hadn't got to see Saturn's moons in such detail before. But what it really wanted to do was go and look at the surface of one of them. So the Huygens probe decided to go and look at Titan. And so Titan is a really interesting moon. It's quite big. It's got a, a thick atmosphere, which it seems to be the only sort of Earth-like atmosphere in our solar system in terms of its density, although its composition is different from ours. It's a very methane-rich um, but Titan has a thick, hazy atmosphere, and we suspected that it might have a solid surface with maybe some features that looked a little like Earth. And while they didn't think they might have water, it might have some other sort of liquids that have similar um, sort of geological and uh, uh, morphological features to the planet of our uh, surface of our planet. And so the Horses Lander is this little fella. Really small little thing, um, just designed to drop down and float down through the atmosphere of Titan, take pictures on its way down and land on the surface. And sure enough, when it took pictures on the way down, you started to see things that looked very similar to the landscape of Earth. So this is a series of four pictures from the upper atmosphere getting lower and lower. And you can see these features. It look a lot like Earth or um, maybe Mars as well, but we know that Mars used to be quite Earth-like in the past. And then when it landed on the surface, and it only operated for about an hour and a half, but it managed to take this picture and send it back to us. And to me, I think that's fantastic. It remains the um, furthest distance picture that's ever been taken of a, a planetary or moon surface sent back to us. And, it, you know, if you didn't know any better, this could be somewhere on Earth, some desert or um, shoreline on Earth. And it saw, Cassini saw images of uh, lakes and river systems, um, all sorts of processes going on there. And we know that Titan is full of hydrocarbons, which we think are um, very important in um, the origin of life. So this is really, really, really interesting stuff. And Titan remained one of the top contenders for um, finding life on other planets. Juno, 2011. Does anybody know which planet Juno um, is currently visiting? Oh, what do we think? Juno, where might that be visiting? We've got a few guesses. Lewis, which Neptune. planet? Lewis thinks Neptune. Uh, George, what do you think? Uranus. Uranus. George thinks Uranus. Jack? Jupiter. Jack thinks Jupiter. We're getting all of them, I think. Lucy. I think Jupiter. Ju uh, Lucy also thinks Jupiter. We'll have one more try. Freya? I think Jupiter. You think it's Jupiter as well. So we've got three votes for Jupiter. Well done, it is Jupiter. Um, good guesses for the outer solar system stuff. Um, unfortunately, we'll have to wait a while until we can get back to Uranus and Neptune because they're so out of sync with their long orbits. But with Juno, we've seen some really interesting pictures. We're all used to seeing these stripy images of Jupiter, but this is um, a view from Jupiter's south pole. Um, so we don't usually get to see Jupiter from this angle. Um, and it's fantastic that there's all little weird clouds going on and details in the atmosphere. Um, and 
Cassini, when it finished its mission, um, the Saturn one, it, um, when it died, it flew into um, the surface of Saturn to get some last data out. And that's what Juno will do too. When it's finished its mission, they'll crash it into the atmosphere of Jupiter and see what comes back. And the name Juno comes from mythology. It's one of Jupiter's wives. Um, so that's where, where that name comes from. But Jupiter is um, still a major contender for people to visit. And also, much like Saturn's moon's Titan, uh, there's also moons around Jupiter that's been very interesting for the possibility of life, and um, Europa being the one that's um, the most interesting. So then on to New Horizons, for, that was launched in 2006. Does anybody know where New Horizons went? Any guesses? Where might New Horizons have gone? Might be a clue in the title. Um, Freddie? This is a big guess, but Mars? Freddie thinks Mars. Um, Emma, what do you think? Saturn. Uh, we've got Noah, do you want to guess? Venus. Venus. We'll have one more, Harrison. Neptune. Neptune. Oh, Arrhenius. Right. The closest there was Neptune. Actually, it's gone furthest out to look at um, our, our little friend Pluto, right on the edge of the solar system there. So Pluto um, was always thought to be, when they first dis discovered Pluto, they thought it might be another big gas giant because this is a long time ago. They didn't um, have the ability to send spacecraft there. Um, then when we got some sort of little pictures of it a bit closer up, we thought it might just be this boring little rock. But actually it turned out it's pretty interesting. It's got all sorts of different compositions on the surface. It's got funky ice features. Um, one of the interesting things New Horizons did, it didn't orbit, but as it flew by, it looked back and looked at the sunlight through um, the atmosphere and um, that you can see here. So it's not a thick atmosphere like ours, it's more of an exosphere, just like a collection of um, molecules around it. But it, you're able to see some hazy details of, of it. And also even more interestingly, Pluto has its own little satellites. So satellites of Pluto were imaged by New Horizons. It has a whole bunch, the biggest being Charon here on the left, which is about half the size of Jupiter. Um, but Jupiter, uh, sorry, um, Pluto, but Pluto, um, used to be a planet, as I think most of you know, we might have spoken about before, got downgraded to a fourth planet, and it's in this region called the Kuiper Belt that has loads of these little sort of lumps of rock. Some of them are big enough to be round, others smaller potato looking. Um, and so these are all little satellites of Pluto that were imaged with New Horizons. So these are fantastic images that are coming back from that. And again, I'd urge you to go and have a look at some of the New Horizons um, images because they're really beautiful. And Pluto, it may not be a planet anymore, but it's still a very, very interesting thing to look at. And so then I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the new space age. Um, does anybody know um, what this is a picture of here on this slide? What do you think? Any ideas? Chloe? Somebody driving a car in space. Somebody driving a car in space? Oh. Yep, yeah, so it is a person, a picture of somebody driving a car in space. It's not a real person, it's just a dummy inside. But this was, um, if you've heard of Elon Musk or SpaceX, so this is the sort of privatized um, era of space travel. So Elon Musk runs this company called SpaceX. He also owns a couple of other companies. Uh, very, 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 very rich person. He's a billionaire. And he's been um, launching rockets to do scientific work as well, so to deliver things to the space station. Been doing trials at the moment for um, launching humans again with the SpaceX industry. And so whereas before it would be uh, governments and states that were doing this sort of stuff, um, he's kind of pioneering a, a privatized route to it. And what he did um, was put one of his cars from the car company he owns into space and launch it with this little dummy astronaut inside. Um, and it was on its way to Mars, I think. But I'm not sure what will happen when it gets there. But um, you can go online and watch, um, watch this car being launched into space. So this is a real photograph of his car in space with the dummy in it looking back at Earth. Um, and there's a... There's debate over whether this is a good thing or not. I mean, if there's not the political will that we had from the Soviet Union and Cold War with the United States, um, and governments are not paying for this stuff, then is it a good thing that private companies are paying for this stuff? But then if they're private companies, they want to make money, right? So they're not doing it just because they'd like to understand the universe and give the people something. They want to make money. So um, what are they going to do to make money? Are we going to go and mine some of the hydrocarbons that we find on these moons and asteroids? Um, who owns it? You know, there's lot, lots of ethics 
discussions to be had about what is right and what is wrong and will it be a good thing that um there's privatization for space industry and even if it's a bad thing is that better than nothing at all and um, so lots to think about with that um but it's an exciting time with lots of new missions being planned at the moment as we saw with some of these distances of how far these planets are you can be planning a mission and launch it and it will take years or decades even to reach its destination um so these things need to be planned a long time in advance <coughs> that are being planned and executed now will get out to these targets and sending back that data when you are um, about the age to be going into high school, university and so on. So there'll never be any shortage of things to study. Um, and yeah, if you want to get into um, planetary science, particularly of the outer solar system, uh, the younger the better because these things take up whole people's lives because they take decades to plan and execute. Um, so I think that's about all I've got to say for that. So thank you very much for joining me. I'm just going to um, stop sharing my screen and come back to you so that you can see me. There we go. Um, so if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Right, any questions to do with the journey to space? Uh, what do you think? Olivia? How long does it take for a rocket to get up to space? What do you mean by space? Do you mean a particular place in space? What which particular space are you thinking about? Now, how long would it take to travel to Mars in a rocket? So Mars is fairly close by um, compared to things like Pluto and Neptune that we've been looking at. So um, the actual border of space is not very far at all. It takes you minutes to get up there. You might have seen like Richard Branson and um, other companies like offering to take you to space and they mean to just go up to the very border of it. So you might be weightless and you'll be able to see the earth is round and stuff, but you're really just right on the border and you can get there um, pretty quickly in a matter of minutes. Um, moon is about three days away, uh, but the moon is always about the same distance from us. But Mars is a bit tricky because if you imagine the orbits of the planets, <laughs> in the middle, I'll use my microphone here is the sun. So you've got the sun in the middle here and then you've got Earth going around, and then Mars, as we discussed, we've kept those laws, is further out but going slower. So sometimes they're on opposite sides. So you'll have the Sun in the middle, and then two planets on either side. And so then it would take you a really long time to get there, maybe two years. But what we tend to do is try and launch something to Mars around every 24 months because that's the time when Earth and Mars are at their closest. And then it takes about five months to get there. So it's still a, a long way, and it's one of the problems with sending humans out further. Um, when you send humans um, into interplanetary space when they're away from the Earth, they're no longer protected by our um, gravitational field. And so they're very, it's very easy for them to get um, hurt by radiation from the sun. <coughs> Excuse me. And so our astronauts on the International Space Station have some protection from that. When we sent people to the moon, there was actually an incident where there was um, some radiation emanating from the sun that could have hurt them if it had been at a slightly different time. But once you've got... Um, five month long trip, then you're really increasing your risk of being hit by some quite dangerous radiation. We don't yet have the um, ability to predict those uh, very well or to protect astronauts from them. Um, then when you look at something like New Horizons, I think that was about 10 years it took it, launching in 2006, uh, not, yeah, and then yeah, it's taken it over 10 years to get there. So it's a, it's a long way away. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Jacqueline? Uh, Emma, what's your question? Right, so um, I don't know if you heard that. Emma's saying she thinks it takes about eight minutes for light from the sun to get to Earth. Is that right? Yeah, that's so, right. Your question is, how long would it take us to travel to the sun? Ah, that's a really great question. So if we could travel at the speed of light, it would take us eight minutes because that's the speed of light. Um, however, we can't travel at the speed of light or anywhere near it at this point. Um, in fact, coming back to Albert Einstein, he part of his theories is that um, the speed of light is the speed limit of the universe and that nobody could ever break that. And as you get faster, your mass increases and your um, your weight would become infinite as you've got to that. So there's all sorts of weird rules around the physics of going that fast. Um, 
But currently, um, I'm not, I can't tell you off the top of my head the speed of some of these spacecraft, but we're sending stuff to the sun. We've got missions that go there. Um, so like Solar Orbiter um, is um, heading there. And uh, I'm not sure how long it takes. So let me just think. So Mars is about uh, half an astronomical unit away from us, and that takes about five months. And the sun is one. So I'd say you could probably get to the sun in about 10 months. Uh, at the speeds of our current spacecraft. That's my right. estimate. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Lewis. Um, I don't know if this counts as one, but why is like planets a circle, not like squares? Lewis would like to know why planets are circles, not squares. That's a really, really interesting question. Um, so um, there's lots of uh, maths around this that you can understand the physics of it, but um, Interestingly, I showed you a couple of those other little moons or satellites of Pluto, and some of them are not round, right? They're kind of like potato shaped. And we have lots of little moons, like Mars' moons are potato shaped, and lots of things in the astro asteroid belt are potato shaped. But the bigger ones are round. And in fact, that comes as part of the definition of a planet, is that it has to be round. So why are they round? And it's because they're more massive and they're bigger. So once something becomes really big, um, it starts to collapse down from every single direction around in sort of all degrees in every direction and if you for example try to build a big tower say you wanted to go outside and get a whole load of like dirt and build a big tower and you build it up and up and up and as high as you could um eventually it would collapse and fall down right especially if it was made of something loose like sand and that's because of gravity um it's pulling it down and the the weight of it and the mass of it is too much for the structure and it falls down but then you're thinking, well, we do have things like that. We have mountains, right? So they get pretty tall, um, but they're made of much harder, denser stuff, rock, that um, if it gets, um, you can get pretty high. So uh, Mount Everest is, is really big and tall. But Mount Everest is only that high for a reason. There's a reason why we don't have really, 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 really tall mountains. Because if they try to get too tall, they'll reach a, a point where they'll collapse and uh, there'll be slope failure is what they call it. And so the mountain will collapse down and bits will fall off of it. And so there's a limit to how high mountains can get. And this is essentially what makes things round because on every part of the planet, all around the surface, anytime anything tries to break that rule of getting a little bit too high, it will collapse back down and come round. And so the smaller something is, the less gravity there is and the easier it is for it to get taller. And so we see this with Olympus Mons on Mars, which is a volcano on Mars, which is three times the height of Everest. It's about 27,000 um, uh, meters. So this means that um, the less gravity you have, the more things can stick out in funny directions. And so they can be potato shaped. But once they get really massive, they will want to squish down and even themselves out on every side as the things that are too tall and bumpy collapse and push themselves into a ball. Um, also, a sphere is a very efficient shape in physics. So when you blow a bubble, it will want to be round. Um, and also, similarly, the stars and stuff tend to be round because um, uh, everything wants to just pull itself to the middle evenly, uniformly, in every direction. Um, but we do see some deviation from this. Example, if you've got um, a planet or a star that's spinning very fast, uh, much like if you spin around wearing a skirt or something, it will fly out. Um, similarly, um, something like Saturn is where it's spinning quite fast, it becomes a bit squished and fatter in the middle than it is um, from top to bottom. So you do get, it's never perfectly round because you've always got things spinning and making things funny shapes or you've got mountains. So the Earth looks round, but there obviously are lumps and bumps and dips and troughs. But ultimately, the bigger it is, the more it wants to squish everything down all in one direction. Does that, does that make sense? That does make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, we've got lots of nods. Thank you for explaining that. We've got another question. Have you got time for another one? Question. Great. One more question. I'm going to ask Freya. Freya's always got good questions. How do the missions have there ever been a mission that's managed to try and touch the ground on Venus? On Venus, yes. So um, one of the ones I mentioned at the beginning, the Soviet missions to Venera, they had landers, and you can go and look up, you can see pictures. <laughs> Venus is a very interesting one. You can't see the surface with um, visible light, so you can't just use normal cameras to take a picture because the atmosphere is really thick. So they have to use radar to look through the clouds. And so we've got a good idea of what the surface looks like. And we know that the environment there is really hot, really horrible. 
So to be able to build something to uh, withstand those kind of environmental conditions is really tough. So if you look up the Venera missions from the Soviet Union, they landed on the surface. I can't remember how long their lander survived. It's not long, but it's uh, quite a long time considering how horrible it is. Um, but it was uh, maybe not more than an hour or something. Um, but you can see photos um, of what it took off the surface. And if you have a look at the high temperatures and pressures on that surface, and it's really quite a feat of engineering. And nobody's been back to put anything on the surface since. So there's other missions that have looked at it from orbit, um, and hopefully one day. But I think Venus is a bit low on the priority list for sending landers because there's probably not a good candidate for life because of those high pressures and temperatures and um, really toxic, horrible um, atmospheric conditions. So it's not considered one of the ones where you want to go and send things to sample. So that's why places like Mars um, are really um, the focus of sending rovers and landers. Because, you know, we could be sending all these rovers to the moon. It's much closer by and cheaper to get to. But the moon, again, is not a good candidate for life. But Mars, we know it had liquid water. It's got all these like different minerals and stuff and lots of conditions that make it look like it could have had life or maybe have life underground. And eventually when we the technology gets better, we'll probably do things like go and try and look through the ice on Europa or Enceladus out in the outer solar system. Um, but yeah, they wanted to land on Titan and they want to land on Mars because it's a very good candidate for life. So I don't know if we'll see any Venus landers in the <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question. It's, as always, it's been a pleasure talking to you. So thank you very much. And I hope to speak to you again soon. Brilliant. Should we just say bye? Bye. bye. Thank you. See you later.